Um, as Trina said, I was a little more reluctant than my wife to come tonight and do a presentation. Um, and uh, partially because partially I'm a little more introverted than she is, um, but also because sort of, um, this time I'm gonna, we're going to talk about tonight in Alaska, um, it's, sort of, it's a real personal time for me. Um, so there's a lot of sort of emotions attached to it and sort of a philosophy of life that was attached to living in Alaska. So we're going to talk about that and try to dive in deep there tonight, hopefully. Um, we're also going to make time for questions as well. So please, as we're moving along, if you have a, a burning question that you want, you want to get out there, there's a good chance I'll answer it at some point, but feel free to ask it during whatever topic we might be talking about. There's so much material here that it's going to be really hard to scratch the surface. So the more we were flushing out this presentation, the more we were like, wow, like how do you even do a deep dive into some of these things where it can take you know, hours to even just talk about the dog aspect of things, the sled dog aspect of it. There's hours in hot, uh, tra uh, traveling in the bush. There's hours in a cabin building. I mean, there's so much material here that it's really hard to pick and select what we wanted to talk about. So we're really just going to be kind of scratching the surface. Um, so again, my name is Matt Emsley. It's my wife, Julie. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the time frame first and kind of build the context for how we got to Alaska, both individually and then together. Um, and then we'll kind of zoom in um, to where, we, where our cabin currently is now. Um, but to step back a little bit, we do live in, in Baroqua, and we've been living here for about four years now. So we transplanted from Alaska to here. Neither of us is from Alaska originally. Um, Julie grew up in Northwest Indiana. I grew up in upstate New York. Um, and so we found our, found our way there separately and then met there in about 2005. Um, so the time frame that we're going to talk about tonight is I moved to Alaska in 1999 um, and most of the pictures that we're going to see and gonna, most of the material we're going to talk about takes place from about 2002 to 2015. Um, that's kind of that time period we're talking about. Um, with some other isolated things between now and then. Most reason we're not talking about much prior to 2002 is that I really don't know how many pictures <laughs> from prior to 2002. Um, so that's one of the reasons for that. Um, so uh, a couple notes, um, a couple disclaimers. This is completely unrehearsed, for one. Um, both for myself and for our, when Julie and I were trying to flesh this out, we realized that we were in some time, in some ways, in some aspects where we were on different pages about how we, what we thought about this, and I'm much more of a shoot from the hip kind of person, and she's more, more of a full-on plan this out and just go and do a presentation. Um, so we're trying to blend those two styles a little bit so that everyone, yeah, so you both get what we need. Um, so there, were, there are some marriage dynamics. Are you that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's still love each other at the end, that's a challenge. Um, so, and again, uh, yeah, so that's, that's that. So let's just build the context a little bit and then jump in. So one of the first questions we always get is, how did you find your way to Alaska and why Alaska? So I grew up in upstate New York. I spent, I went to a university um, in the state of New Hampshire. Um, so, and then I, so I went to school in New Hampshire. I spent, I spent about 10 years in New Hampshire and Maine in my 20s, and then moved to Alaska when I was 29 or 30 in 1999. Um, so one of the reasons I went to Alaska, the main reason I went to Alaska is that I had a really strong wilderness. I was really working deeply in the wilderness. I had done a lot of outdoor education all through my 20s. I was an outbound instructor. I had gone through an outdoor education program at the university. I was doing a lot of climbing, a lot of hiking, a lot of paddling, a lot of everything in the wilderness. Um, and when you do that much, and it got to the point where I was spending up to 300 nights a year in a sleeping bag. For a couple of years there, I remember counting those like, like, it was really amazing life through my 20s, but at the same time, that, what, the more you do that stuff and the deeper you get, especially if you have any kind of traditional sort of bent to you, and I've got a really strong, like, I like to do things myself, I like to do it with my own hands, I like, I like the old way of doing things, and the more you kind of immerse yourself in that, and if you're in the wilderness, then obviously Alaska is kind of a holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, and so the more I was doing that, the more I started to feel this pull. Um, and I, so I hopped right over the Rockies and just wanted to keep on going further and further and further out. So I had gone to grad school in New Hampshire, too, to be a teacher. So my leap into Alaska was that I started, I took a job teaching elementary school in a little Eskimo village right here in a place called Kayana, which is just above the Arctic Circle. So this is what we call the Northwest Arctic area of Alaska. So this is Northwest Arctic School District. Um, a small Eskimo village, about a population of about 300 people. I went under the auspices of teaching 
But really the reason I went there is because I was looking for a way to get deeper and deeper and deeper into the wilderness. Um, and that's what, that's what I wanted. But I had student loans. I think I had $30,000 in student loans. I didn't have any money in my pocket. So I went and I taught school for two years. I paid off all my student loans, put about twenty thousand. You got those student loans too because you lived in a shack that was like you paid two hundred dollars a month for. <laughs> Actually, hundred. Oh, oh hundred. Yeah. <laughs> and um and like was heated with a wood stove that like in some mornings you'd wake up and be like twenty below and you wouldn't even like warm it and go to work, right? So and go to teach the kids. So like do whatever you could to pay off that. Yeah, I was living very frugally, but at the same time, what happened was <laughs> that I was in the picture. That there might have been. No. I was like, there would be a Matt and Julia if that was a game. So what I was doing in Cayenne was I was not only really teaching school and paying off student loans, but I knew I had pretty good wilderness skills, but I didn't have Arctic skills. And that's a whole other thing. To be able to, 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 especially doing it the way I wanted to do it. Some teachers go and they teach school, and that's what they want to do, and that's great. And they live in the village, and they live in teacher housing, and they have a great experience in those native communities. And, um, but for me, it was also a vehicle for getting deeper. So what I needed is I needed more wilderness skill. I needed more Arctic skills, deep, deep, cold skills. And so while I was there in that, in that Eskimo village, um, which is PC to say, um, some people, uh, the, the yeah, Canadian, Alaska, the Canadian Eskimo is typically, it's a more of a derogatory term, but in Alaska, Eskimo is still accepted. Um, but I was learning as much as I could. I started running dogs when I was living in Kayana. I, I kind of did an informal apprenticeship under an um, uh, Eskimo elder as far as how to build dog sleds. I, was, I learned how to build, taught myself how to build snowshoes. I taught myself how to weave fishnets. Um, I was putting all those skills together so that I could jump off somewhere deeper. And that was the whole point of this whole thing for me. Um, so after two years of teaching and every month, every day, trying to make connections further into the bush to try to find an opening somewhere, to find a cabin, to find a piece of property, to find somewhere to go, I finally made connections with a place up here called the Amblin River. Okay? And so the Amblin River is this beautiful river that comes right out of Gates of the Arctic National Park. Okay. Um, It'll come back. Yeah. So it, that river comes right out of Gates of the Arctic National Park, right out of the Brooks Range in Alaska, which is here. Um, that had been in part of a state homesteading program in the 1970s, so there were a bunch of five-acre parcels that had been proved up by different people at that time. Um, and I had contacted one of the owners of that property, and they said, yeah, go ahead and use the cabin. They hadn't used it for 20 years, so they said, go ahead and use it. Um, and so that's what I did for another year. I moved way out. I stopped teaching. I moved out. Uh, and that was my deep dive into Arctic wilderness living. Um, this became unsustainable to me, partially because I was starting to, I didn't have enough money to live year round and make a living, so I always had to go out to work in the summertime. So that became my pattern for seasons. Um, season for years after that was that I would live in the wilderness in the winter and then come back out in the summers, and that would be my cash base. I'd work in Fairbanks. Uh, I work in Juneau down here, which a lot of people know from the cruise ship industry. Um, and that's actually where I met Julie in 2005. I was down here working on a glacier. Um, and, but what happened was that this area is so far north that it's, it was a fly-in, fly-out only situation. And that gets really expensive with a dog team. You can imagine having to hire a plane, to charter a plane to get you and your dogs out each summer seasonally so you can go and work and then fly back in with all of your supplies, all of your equipment. And the other part is it's so far north is that typically you couldn't get out until June and you had to go back in by August. You're flying the dogs too? Yeah. With you. Yeah. So it's really interesting. So these planes, sometimes they'll take these six or eight or ten seater planes and they'll, or, or four seaters and they'll pull out all the seats. Hmm. And then you can clip in your dogs into the walls of the plane. Not many pilots will do it. Not many companies will do it um, because they're worried about dogs getting loose in the plane and that can be really dicey. Um, but because there's uh, a lot of uh, dog sled racing up in the world here. People are people are flying their dog teams quite commonly. And we have we have friends, um, Ashley and Tyler, who they've been on. Uh, they're on one of the, the reality shows, but they live they fly their dogs out every year, and they're up by the uh, yeah. We have area. friends that live up here somewhere. And they do that every year. They fly their dogs in and out. Younger couple, not young kids too. So at that point I started looking, I was like, this isn't really sustainable. I can't, I can't make money and be flying out and work with this time frame. And I didn't need much money. That was kind of the point too that's interesting to think about. I figured out at one point that for $3,000 a year, I could live out for eight or nine months. And that was like my bare minimum. 5,000 was a lot better. So it wasn't like I needed a lot of money and I didn't need to work for a long time, but I did need some kind of cash base. Um, and so what I ended up doing was 
the long, make the long story short, I had known of a musher here, a dog musher here, who had a type of dog that I was looking for. And so I had gotten a couple of puppies from him the year prior. Okay, and his name's Andy Bassich. And some of you, if you've ever seen Life Below Zero, okay, a little controversial. I was going to ask you right off the bat when I heard you were by Eagle, because I thought, isn't that where Andy lives? It is, it's exactly. You'll hear a little bit about Andy. Below zero. Yeah, they just their nearest neighbors up. Yeah, we'll show you some. So, okay. he, and so he was my first contact at Eagle. And I still remember sending him an email with that saying, hey, Andy, you know, thanks for the puppies, da da da. How is this area? How is Eagle? Is there, is there room for a guy to go out and live in the wilderness? Like, is there space? Is it possible? And his answer was, if you're, if you're willing to work hard enough for it, what do you like that? No, if you're can a guy go live out the woods? Just can a guy go live out the woods here? You know? And uh, so anyway, Andy said, yeah, you know, if a guy's willing to work hard enough for it, then sure, you know, there's space out here. So through Andy, he connected me with a cabin. I spent a winter here in a cabin. And then um, the following year, I found a piece of property and built a cabin on it. We're talking about um, I did want to put this, this whole map in perspective a little bit. I know a lot of people are familiar with how large Alaska is, but I did do some numbers today. I just Googled some numbers just to help people understand a little bit. So um, the square miles in Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, square miles are something like 60,000, 60, 65,000 square miles. Alaska is 663,000 square miles, so that's more than 10 times the size of Wisconsin. What you're looking at, okay? In Alaska, too, and this other, it's 2.3 times the size of Texas, and it's big, the next three biggest states combined: California, Montana, and Texas combined. Alaska is bigger than that. And then the farthest, some people ask about the climate. So we we met with people in Juno, in Fairbanks, and in Eagle, um, and people ask about the climate or the daylight. And it's just such a vast state. So the farthest eastern point and the farthest western point of Alaska is the same distance from New York City to Los Angeles. So if you can just think of like the difference between in climate, topography, all of that between those two, you know, kind of gives you perspective of how big Alaska is too. Yeah, you have places like Juno that are a lot like Seattle, and then all the way to like Barrow, which is more like the North Pole, all within the same state. Um, the state of Wisconsin is something like what did I figure out, 300 miles tall by 250 miles wide. Alaska, the bulk of Alaska is about 800 by 800. But then I couldn't believe it when, I, when they looked at the numbers there. If you do the full numbers, it's like 2,300 miles, I think that's long, or must be, must be long, by 1,400 miles wide if you include all the, all the way out to the end of the Aleutian Islands way out here. So it's just vast. And that was one of the first things I realized when I got there. After spending a few years in Alaska, I realized that you could spend a lifetime you could spend 50 lifetimes and still barely scratch it. You know, like I, you know, after spending even like 15 years right here, and we travel a lot with dogs and we do a lot of different things, but we barely, barely touched outside this area. You know, same thing when I was living up here, barely touched outside. There's just so many rivers and creeks and streams and mountains and valleys and gullies and just things you can just go endlessly. And you, it's just incredibly vast. It's, it's hard to sort of wrap your mind around it, from, especially from a lower 48 standpoint. No. So that's a little, um, population-wise, 750,000 people in Alaska. What's the what's population of Wisconsin? Anything else? No, no, no. Okay. okay, I think I wrote it down, but I'll scratch here. I'll scratch the paper. <laughs> anyway, um, the other interesting thing about Alaska, also to build the context, is that other than Anchorage, Fairbanks, and Juneau, so those three population centers account for over half of the population. Okay, of Alaska. English. What's that? I think that it's in the Matsu Valley right here. Is about, I think it's about half of the. If you go out of Anchorage and just go to the surrounding suburbs, that's about half too. So, anyway. Yeah, great. Um, but otherwise, there's about 100, somewhere in the ballpark of 100 what we call bush villages. And the definition for us of a bush village is, is a village that's not connected to the road system. So that means fly-in only, or snow machine only, or boat only. There's a lot of boat only villages down here in the southeast, uh, down here in the peninsula. Um, so you can map all these little speckled little bush villages. Most of them are native populations. So in Alaska, that means either Athabascan Indian or Eskimo. And there's three different Eskimo groups in Alaska. There's the Yupik Eskimos out here on the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta out here. Um, pretty traditional, probably the, because they're the most isolated, they retain more of their culture. Um, the Inupiat Eskimos are up here, um, and then the Athabascan Indians 
are generally central, and then the, the alley-oop uh, Eskimos down here in okay? And then some clinket, which you also get down in the British Columbia, which is more Indian. Um, so those are kind of the main population groups. And then you have all this sort of white explorer, settler, missionary, trapping history that sort of blended the whole state and mixed things. Generally speaking, historically, the, the groups don't get along very well. They do now better than ever, but you know, typically there's, there's antipathy. Antip 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 anyway, there's a little conflict between Eskimos and Indians. And there's borderlands, like you know, like when you're crossing and people tell you, oh, you're crossing into Indian land, you're crossing into Eskimo land, just so you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Yeah, do you want to yeah. jump into the context too? For, do you want to talk about England being yeah. like a place that you could drive into? Sure, okay, yeah, so road systems. So we talked about the bush communities, about 100 of them throughout Alaska. Yeah, Jeff. So are, are they like, um, Reservations here, so are they yeah. lands that are that they um, yeah. have their own lease right. course and their own. So um, this is this is a deep dive on this would take hours and there's books in it. Yeah, I would say the short of that. Uh, yeah, my my master's actually has an Alaska Native Studies component to it. So like the short of it is that by the time things came around with Alaska uh, to realizing, okay, we need to kind of reconfigure because we've kind of come in and taken crop like land that wasn't ours or whatnot. What happened is we realized that the reservation model didn't really work as much. I'm broad stroking here, but didn't work that as, as well as we would have hoped in the lower 48. So instead, in Alaska, what they ended up doing is created, created, creating for-profit corporations. So there's 12, 13 total, but 12 for-profit corporations that were given money and a, a, a significant amount of money and a significant amount of land. Um, to each corporation for the different regions of the state. The 13 corporations for Native Alaskans that no longer live in Alaska. And then those corporations that went on to distribute that to their shareholders. So in Alaska, that's kind of a funny thing where the Native population all are, share, are, are all shareholders. So in some ways, like they'll, instead of them asking like what tribe do you belong to, it might be like what, what Native corporations do you have shares. Um, and so it's just it's this interesting model. I'm like, yes, we could spend so much time on it. But it's very unique there, it's very different. And the diversity, again, because of Aspen of Alaska, so there's like, and I'm, this, is, this is going back a number of years, but there's as many tribes in um, diversity in Alaska than there is in the rest of the lower 48 as far as native population. So there's a lot of different dynamics, they've done it so differently there. So, um, and that's one of the pieces as far as the bush. Um, another unique thing, and part of the reason Matt had such a hard time finding property out there is about 90% of the state is public lands. So as far as being able to find a private piece of land or a private um, that you can that you can own yourself, it can be really difficult out in the bush. Mm -hmm. However, that some of the ways is that when that property was distributed, it was distributed a lot to some of the native communities and, and individuals. And so over time, sometimes these are sold or exchanged, and, and or the other way that people also are able to acquire property in the in the bushes through that homestead act that Matt referenced, which I think that's what our property was originally. No, it's actually a native law. Okay, but this still need a lot of it. So what happened in Alaska? So in the 1970s, when Alaska was sort of reckoning with all of a sudden this influx of oil money, potentially millions and billions of dollars of oil money, is they quickly realized that they, they need to sort it out. They need to sort out land. What land belong to what people, especially from the mineral rights perspective? And so all the, the regional corporations that Julie uh, mentioned, you know, had a chance to claim kind of their native territories. And then each native village, like Ambler, for example, in Kayana has a 15 mile radius around it that belongs that sort of native only in terms of you know, hunting, fishing, and utilizing resources. And then every native person was allowed to select, and I think it depends on when and where, anywhere from 40 to 160 acres for their own personal use and personal private property. And so what we call, we call those native allotments. So if you were to put a, a map on your native allotments and overlay, you'd find thousands of Small native lawns, these little squares, boom, 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 boom. And then the other thing was happening was that at that point, the state and the federal government had to figure out all their land, who was going to take what. And so that's why Alaska has all these huge national parks, uh, reserves, uh, national uh, fish and wildlife uh, areas, uh, DNR areas, state areas, uh, and very little private property uh, was a result of the 1970s and 1980s, all of them trying to sort out the land uh, before all the oil money hits. So, that brings us, we're going to um, zoom into Eagle here a little bit and talk about, and zoom right in now that we've kind of talked about the bigger picture. Um, but just to mention too, the road system. 
So some people have been here, some people not. Basically, there's a triangle road system that comes from here to, from Fairfax to Anchorage and out to a place called Togue out here. The Alaska-Canada Highway continues down through British Columbia. There's one road north to Dead Horse, also known as Prudhoe Bay, um, which is where most of the oil is coming out of. The Alaska Pipeline comes right down um, and down to, what's that? Valdez, Valdez thanks. Um, so there's, and so there's, beyond that, there's not really any roads going anywhere, but there is, going back to the logistics and trying to figure out a place to live, there is a road that goes 200 miles north from here, so 400 miles from Fairbanks, that dead ends at Eagle, which is right on the Yukon River. Okay? So what I needed for my lifestyle is I needed a way to get out and be able to work without spending a lot of money on air travel. And that's that conversation with Andy about a place to live, trying to find a place, trying to find a place I can get in and out of reasonably, and that's how Eagle kind of came, became home or near Eagle. And, I would, and something to know with that too is that road from, from there's a town tow here to Eagle, so that last four, that is like a, that's a nine hour trip from Fairbanks to Eagle by, by um, driving. And that road, is it an alternate map? No, the last, only the last 125 Michigan? miles now. So, um, so Matt's even on it. But anyways, um, so that road is like literally kind of through mountain passes. And, it's, you know, and once you get past Toke, four, it's like four hours from Toke, right? Do I remember that right? Uh, yeah. So four hours, and there's nothing between, there's like one little town called Chicken, and I think it's like a population of 17 people that live there. <laughs> so, and then that road as well is only maintained April through September? Uh, May, usually, yeah, May through. May through September. So the rest of the year is flying only. So Eagle's kind of a unique, it's kind of a hybrid. Because when we say Bush and Alaska, I meant like Matt said, it's off the road system, it's flying only. So during most most of the year, you can't, you can only get there by, by plane. Or a long dog trip. Or so much you need. Yeah, sorry about the focus issue, but Eagle's here. Um, this one says our cabin up here. This river is called the Tatondic River, which in Athabascan Han language is. Uh, it translates to the Broken Stone River. Um, so I came into Eagle. There's a road coming right out of Eagle. Okay, again, that 400 miles to Fairbanks. This is the Yukon River, and it flows this direction. Okay, um, the distances here, just, just to put it in perspective, Eagles from Eagle to our cabin by river is about 35 miles. Um, in the winter, by dog team, is about 30 miles. And I say dog team because we always, I always made the choice to just use dogs. Some people use dogs and snowmobiles. Some people just use snowmobiles. So it depends on your, your ethic, what you like, what you prefer. I always wanted dogs. And the reason it's shorter is because there's a lot of cutoffs here. Sure. We'll cut these portages that, that instead of having to go around the long way on the river, you end up cutting through, running the river, cutting through, running the river. Um, the rivers, in, especially in this country, the, because the country is really arduous to cross, it's, it's not huge mountains, but they're in the two to three to five thousand foot range, they're incredibly difficult to penetrate and heavily wooded. They're really steep, steep gullies and ravines. So the rivers and the creeks become our travel corridors, become our highways. Um, so it's what you didn't think about. So when you have, when you're deep in winter, you actually have really easy traveling, relatively speaking, um, compared to any other time of the year. Um, and so once, that's why a lot of people who are running dogs and running snowmobiles really like it, because all of a sudden, your whole world opens up and you can bomb across the country and get places that you can't get other than by boat. Within the context of living out the bush. Within the Compared context. to here, it's a little bit different. Right. Yeah, no roads anywhere else, no real trails. And these trails, these portage trails I kind of referenced, were part of an old mail trail system going back to the late 1800s, early 1900s, when mail was delivered by dog team or horse team. Yeah. Does the river have a rapid to make it uh, pretty hard to get? No, at this point it doesn't. When you, oh, this is uh, a reference point. This is a Canadian line right here, so the Canadian border. So once you cross in it, and you get further, further upstream, um, then you, there are a couple of places along the way where there are rapids. But from this point down, there's a, I think there's one place called Five Finger Rapids, but it's runnable in any, any boat, um, even big boats. So 35 miles, how long would that take you? Yeah, so it, the answer is it depends. Yeah. Uh, early season, like right after everything freezes up and you've got enough snow to travel, by dog team, it could be two days. When things are perfect, like March or February, trails are in and the dogs are in good shape, it might be three hours. So it really varies. And then if a storm comes in and it drops new snow, 
you may not be back to a six hour, eight hour trip if you're having a great trail again. One of our challenges here is that Eagle's a really small village. There's 100 people in Eagle, which means there's very few people out there traveling, making new trails, running their snowmobiles in places that you might have in a bigger village than in it. Snowmobiles have their uses, and one of their uses from a dog musher's perspective is that they're really good at breaking a trail out and, and knocking down new snow way easier than a dog team can do it and way faster. But we don't really have much here. We've got about 100 people on Eagle. About 20 of those, I would say, or 15 are actually active in terms of like getting out and doing things, whether it's hunting or trapping or running dogs or whatever it might be, sort of living more of a traditional lifestyle. Um, and, and, I, and too, I was just going to say, so we actually drew this too here because this is kind of our community out there. So Eagle is the town, like Matt said, where there's about 80 or so people like that live there year round. From going to, to the river, so this is the Yukon River, our friends Wayne and Scarlett, that's the next, the family that lives on the river, they're about six miles. So it takes typically about 45 minutes, give or take, like by a snow machine to get there. And the trail there is pretty straightforward around the Yukon the whole time. Our friend Andy, so he's about another hour and 15 ish. <laughs> This is, again, it totally depends. And then to get from Andy's to our place is usually about two hours. These are the things I tell myself when I'm on the back of runners when it's like really cold. Um, so between Andy's and our place, especially when we were living out there, Matt was out there you know, for those nine months of the year, you know, there's nothing out, there's nobody else. We do have friends, too, that have a cabin between the mouths of the Tatangit and our home cabin that, that they go out there maybe just a couple times a year. Um, and so sometimes it's, they're, they're great, and so every time they're out there or we're out there, it's like, it's wonderful. And then beyond that, we do, since around the time we kind of left the bush, our friends Nate and Ruby moved out. We're able to finally, Nate had been searching for land forever, and finally was able to move, and, and he's like eight miles, would you say, over land mm -hmm. um, from our cabin. And so that would take like, you know, but it's totally like Matt said. Um, one of the things about the rivers being the highways, like, uh, first of all, there's times of years where you can't, the year that you can't travel on the river. So there's break up and freeze up. So the seasons to me in Alaska, there's summer, there's freeze up, there's winter, and there's break up. Um, and so basically you have your summer period, and then when the river starts freezing over, and again, that just depends on conditions. It could take three weeks, it could take two months. And you can't travel on the river. Um, and so in our case, if we needed to get to Eagle, which was like, say we needed to, I don't, I don't know, like, go make a phone call or something, <laughs> um, let our parents know where we're okay. Um, you know, that, we couldn't get there. We couldn't really get anywhere. You know, we had to stay pretty much, and it was mostly that that would be out there during that time. And then the other period of year is breakup, and that's usually around May every year. Um, and that, that's shorter, that's usually like three to five weeks, would you say? on average. So that's just something to think about too is they're just not available. And then the other thing too that I always think about um, is that because it's water and and it's so subject to the conditions and the weather, it's constantly changing. So even if you knew a snowfall would come, and we'll probably get it and Matt would be able to explain this. We have pictures so we can maybe start showing some of those yeah. too. But, um, but there's things like overflow, the ice melts. There's times where we would come to a trail or a section in the river where it was totally so like soaking wet. Um, sometimes that can be predictable, sometimes not. Um, there's times too, especially during breakup, we were there about a year ago with our kids and it was unseasonably warm. And even though it was like in late March, the days were like 40 degrees, so the trails were starting to rot out and the Yukon itself was starting to, to melt from the top. And so there was there were parts where we were you know had we're getting into deep water sometimes even up to like thighs, but there was like feet and feet and feet of ice beneath that because essentially the sun is melting it from the top and then overnight it would freeze again and then depending sometimes you could go across that with a team of dogs and be fine um, and then sometimes you know it would break through so it's just the the, the point is that the conditions were always changing. Um, <coughs> Did you want to show some yeah. pictures? Any questions? <coughs> yeah. Uh, how did you supply your food? Okay. Number one. <laughs> number two. I want to travel with number two. Okay. <laughs> I'll go to number one and see if I can come back to number two. Okay. So my plan, everybody's plan is a little different. So I'll just tell you how I, and I say a lot of times I say I because the, for the first six or seven years I was doing this on my own and Julie wasn't part of the picture. 
And so that's why I say hi sometimes, not to be rude. Um, so I would work in the summertime either in Fairbanks or Juneau. So I would have my truck and I would come back to Eagle. Typically I would bring the dogs back, I would drop them off with a friend, and then I would start doing supply runs back and forth <coughs> to Fairbanks. So I'd drive like 400 miles one way, the next, and do a, spend a day shopping, and spend four, and then drive the 400 miles back to Eagle, drop off my things, maybe run some of them down river by boat, or just create a cache here. My uh, Andy, our friend Andy that we mentioned, he had an old school bus here, and he let me store things in the back of a school bus, and just as a storage building. Um, so normally what I would do is I would, every year I figured I'd spend about $3,000 on food and supplies for the winter, okay? So a lot, about 1,000 of that would be in dog food, and we'll talk more about feeding dogs, feeding fish. Um, the other 2,000 was in people food. And so we would shop at a store just like any of the, like the Sam's Club again, one for example, and just load up on you know anything you could think of. A lot of bulk food, a lot of sundries, a lot of canned food. You know, 50 pounds of um, of, of rice, 100 pounds of flour. You know, 50 pounds of powdered whole milk. You know, 40 pounds of cheese in five pound blocks. Uh, bags of coffee, canned milk, you know, whatever I, and every year that would change a little bit based on my prior year, maybe what I'd run out of, what I had enough of, too much of. Um, and so all those supplies would come. Because the thing is here is that, we'll talk about meat and hunting in a minute, but everything, there is a little store in Eagle, but the prices at the store in Eagle are almost exactly twice what they are at Fairbanks. And Fairbanks is expensive. Living in Alaska in general is expensive. Right. You're so already, like a gallon of milk would be like 10 $12. In Eagle. Yes. Did you store your food in the apartment box? Okay, so I would try to buy most things that I bought, almost none of, well, very few things were perishable. Okay, for one. Typically, that time of year in September, your nights are freezing, are well freezing. Um, at the cabin, I have a cold hole in the floor, so I could put, you know, I put eggs, I put um, cheese, or other things, trying to do what else I might have had. Not a lot that was perishable. You know. Yeah, those are the two things, like the ice cream sometimes, those mm -hmm. two cool outside. We would be hand-painting ice cream sometimes. Well, you can show some So that was, that's, you know, running supplies. But the trick is, and you'll see, I mean, even that picture, you can see the boat. So I had built a 19-foot square stern freight canoe. And that's what I used for running supplies. It was, a, for me, it was a perfect boat. For some, a lot of people, it's too small. But for me, it was perfect because I, my philosophy in life, and especially living out there, is I was trying to make things simple or not hard for myself. I was trying to keep things small and easy and manageable because I was a one-man operation at that point. Um, and I didn't want to get into big horsepower, big equipment that I couldn't get out of the water, that I couldn't deal with by myself, that I, I didn't want to have an engine that I couldn't pick up myself. I didn't want to have a boat that I couldn't move myself. And so I kept everything small and tight, um, which for me was sustainable in that way. Um, and so then at this point, when you get to Eagle, you're like, okay, now I need to get all my supplies to the cabin. You have two choices. You can either bring them by boat in the fall to the cabin, or bring some of them by boat to the cabin, wait for the conditions to freeze, and then run everything by dog team. Okay? And there's pros and cons to both of those. My biggest challenge was that if I lived right on the Yukon River, then I would run everything by boat, because that's really easy. Downstream, with the current, I can put 1,000 pounds in the boat, drop it off, bring it to the cabin. My situation was that our cabin is four miles up a side tributary. That side tributary, the Teutonic River, is shallow, it's rocky, it's fast. Um, and sometimes you're, once the water level starts dropping in the fall, you can't run it feasibly anymore without really trashing your equipment, if you can even run it at all. That's what this picture's from, is repairing the hull. Yeah, repairing yeah. the hull of the boat after it's been hammered on rocks. Um, and so I, it, it would depend a bit, a little bit on the year how I would do that. I prefer to get everything in the fall and be done with it, mm -hmm. um, but some years you just couldn't do it. It didn't make sense. I was going to say, I have, lots of, I have lots of memories of being in the boat on the front. So Matt would be in the, in the, in the back in the stern, and I'd be up front on the bow. And you can see it's not, it's not, it's a beautiful boat, but let me just say too that uh, this is a... Are you a full screen? No. Okay. Um, or I don't know how to do it, I should say. <laughs> I just wanted to, to brag on Matt. That's a, like a beautiful cedar strip canoe. It's like a, a nod to how Matt works too, as like a craftsman too. So like everything he does, he's known in the bush for doing it just really well. But um, but anyway, so it, so that's a 19 foot boat. There's like on the front end, it might be hard to see, but just at the at the top there, 
Matt would be, we're like running up the Teutonic and it can be a dicey river and he's on the back working the motor and I'm on the front and he's like, you know, we've got the waves crashing a little bit and he's got the motor going and he's like constantly yelling me for me to get further out over the, like to get as much weight out front as, as I so, can. So that the prop gets higher up so you can actually clear the rocks. So I would literally be like, the, like, like this from here up would be like over the water. <laughs> And he's yelling, he's like, farther, farther. <laughs> and he's like, ice water, too. Like, and I'm just like, I can't get it. <laughs> um, and another, I mean, another, we'll probably jump around. I will flower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but one of the stories, too, so not to go off on of too much of a tangent, but one of my favorite stories, too. So building, I met Matt actually the winter after, the summer after he built the cabin, which is also another good timing thing because I'm not sure if there would be a Matt and Julie if I was in for the cabin building. But um because that hearing that story but but Matt built that cabin with a couple other friends and Max, one of the guys that was up there building with they were running constant loads up to build the cabin. And so they would get to the mouth of the Chitondic. This is okay so I think, yeah, totally. uh, mouth of the Chitondic, which is the river that our cabin is on, they would unload and reset. They were totally living with like no money, so doing things super like as thrifty, which sometimes stupidly as you can. For example, we should have chest waders, but we were too cheap to buy chest waders, so we just had rubber boots and rain pants, and we duct tape the bottom of our rain pants, so that's the water we flush the roof. And these are Arctic rivers; they're like always freezing cold, right? So they would like reset the boat. What can we take up? What would we have to get back and, and go up and then make their way up to Tondik with, with as much as they could. And so Matt would tell, has told me stories about being in the boat where same thing, Max is in the front. He had a different motor to the prop was Lower different. Lower horsepower, yeah. Yeah, and so, so he'd do the same thing with Max being out front trying to like get as much power as you can. And then at a certain point, they would have paddles where they're trying, because as soon, you didn't want to get out of the boat and get in the water. As soon as you got in the water, you're going to get wet. It's, it's slow. Yeah. Slow, it's cold, it's three miles up. So like, so you, you should tell the story of them being of the rocks and the yeah. So you know, the, again, the Titanic is pretty fast, and we were trying to move supplies the best we could. So we were really maxing out the boat. So typically, we'd run a thousand pounds down the Yukon to the mouth. We dump half of it at the mouth, and then we keep on going. We're all trying to do this in the course of one day. You know, we're trying not to spend nights out here. It's September. Days are getting shorter. So now we got about 500 pounds in the front of the boat. In the boat, I've got Max on the front. And we're, at that point, I had a 10 horsepower Honda, which pushed me 500 pounds, two, plus two people upstream against the current, um, was pretty difficult. And so they're literally at points, and this is a very, very clear Arctic River. So you can see the stones, you can see every pebble in the bottom, and everyone's a little different color, so you can see them go by. And we get to these riffles, where we just get full, full, full throttle. And you can just see the pebbles just an inch in time, like one was sort of, you know, and we're like, and then at one point you see them stop, and you're like, and you look around, and you're like, mm, you're, I got Max out in the front, I'm like, Max, grab the paddle, and then he'd be paddling, he'd be paddling for his life, on the, you know, sitting on the, on the bow of the canoe, just paddling for his life, just so we wouldn't have to get out and walk, because again, as soon as we, if we stopped, and we couldn't make any headway, we got out, now instead of being at one mile an hour, we were like, pulling the boat through, through the water, hip deep, and not exactly, this water's like 33 degrees. So we're just, we're freezing, we're, we're numb, and we had one section of the Teutonic that was really difficult, really shallow, that was called the Long Walk, that almost every time you had to walk this quarter mile section, and a quarter mile sounds like nothing, but it would take us like a half an hour, at the end of that half an hour, we could not feel our legs from the thighs down, we could not feel them, we'd just clamber in the boat, and fall on the boat, and try to get the motor going, and then get, get our way back up to the, back up to the cabin, and, hopefully before dark and the last couple of runs that year that we, and that year that we built the cabin was really difficult because we're we're trying to run all our supplies in we're trying to build the cabin we're trying to get all these things done i've got to get a wood stove in the boat and up and i can remember one of the last runs where the river's and at the same time the river's freezing so now there's like ice starting to run in the river and you're really feeling the pressure of time you feel and there's there's blocks of ice like floating down the river against you and and the, the banks of the river are starting to freeze in and get narrow and narrow and narrow and I can remember we're like putting out our headlamps and we're, we're coming upstream and we're trying to get to the cabin. We can't see anything anymore, but we can see the little blocks of ice. And then we get to the cabin and the last like 30 yards is ice in. And we were, it's like, you know, an inch of ice, which isn't, you know, it doesn't seem that thick, but when you're, you know, in a little canoe, 
And I remember just thinking, wow, we're just going to go for it. Like, what are we going to do? We're numb. We're dying here. You know, we're just in max suspense. You know, he's 18 years old. <laughs> this kid I worked with on the glacier, he was awesome. He was like 18 years old, like with ADHD with a work ethic. So he was perfect for a cabinet. At 18, he doesn't have really deep reserves. And he's just spent on the bow of the canoe and he's just dying. And I was like, well, we're just going to go for it. And we just, we just ran through that ice as fast as we 10 miles an hour. Just... <laughs> and we got about halfway through it. And then before we stopped, and we were actually able to walk on the ice and ferry supplies and knock the rest of it over the axe and pull the canoe on. Is that what you're thinking about? Yeah, it's that's fair. <laughs> so, like I said, it was, yeah, it was brutal. And the next, I don't even think I was smart enough the next year to get chest waiters. I think it was like two years later. I thought it was like, I'll spend the 75 bucks to get it. It was life changing. <laughs> it was unbelievable. So, anyway, so there's some pictures of running. And this here. is at the mouth of the Teutonic, so this would be a spot that we would kind of resituate as well. Yeah, that's a Yukon River. And then, do you want to talk about? This is the, the folder that's ha like hauling logistics. Yeah, maybe talk about. I'll just talk about hunting real quick. Okay, you want to talk about? Yeah. This is the. Oh, sorry. This is actually on the drive up to um, that road up into Eagle too. So this is on one of the bridge paths. So just. Uh, so that might be like freighting supplies after a snowfall. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, if you push F11, it makes it full screen. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, we're on the Shutterfly too, which is part of the problem right there's now. There's no F keys on this one. There's no F keys on that one. Get up there and fix it for a while. Oh, wait, here, let me do this. Let me, if we hit this one. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. <laughs> So I want to talk about hunting just a little bit because we were talking about food and supplies. So I did hunt when I was here on the river. The fall was always a busy time when you kind of run supplies, and kind of hunt potentially. I've always been a reluctant hunter. I, for me, I, I'll do it because I need to do it, but I'm not a sport hunter. I'm not. Uh, I would do it for the meat. Typically, in this country, we have a lot of moose. We don't have many caribou. There are big caribou, caribou migrations through here, but they don't use our river valley, the Teutonic River. You might see them sometimes on the banks, but they tend to flow around Eagle and in the mountains here, and then come either this way or come that way. These are really mountainous areas up our river into Canada, and so the caribou don't use those corridors. And so caribou is a really nice size animal. It's more like a deer. So for me, when I was living alone, a caribou would be like perfect. Like, uh, but we didn't have them, and so we had moose, and a moose is like four times the size of a caribou, and I couldn't utilize the moose well, so I didn't want to take one. Um, we also have, because this is really canyony up here and really mountainous, we did have doll sheep up this river, okay, which makes it kind of unique in the area. A lot of them are over on the Canadian side, but we did have some way up um, towards the border, and that was another resource that I would utilize at some point with, were doll sheep. Um, and another, another thing I think about the moose too, so just kind of in the nature of the bush lifestyle as well, you know, there is at least one or two winters where we got hind quarter from front of the head of moose. Um, so a lot of just sharing in that way. Matt's kind of, I don't know if we'll time for this, but Matt's kind of trade out there was building sleds too, so it's really common for him to fix sled, fix like some stanchions on their sled and get 40 cans of fish. Um, and so uh, so moose as well. And too, just as an added tip or, or added note that like too when you got a whole hindquarter of moose, literally we, we just hang it outside. Um, and then when it was time for dinner, I'd be like, oh, for dinner, I'm like, oh man, can you go cut off a piece of, can you go out with a saw? And, and it was free. And that's the thing too with Alaska, you know, maybe to be clear too, especially where we lived, you know, it didn't get above freezing at all for six months. So like come October 15th for sure, it was not getting above freezing and, you know, until April again. So as far as food storage and whatnot, that was something too. Like we really have to worry about food spoiling because we always had the outdoors. So, um, um, don't you have to worry about critters though? Nothing bears. else that come out and eat so, food? So bears, so that bears weren't an issue in the winter because they hibernate. Um, ravens would be our biggest issue. Yeah. Hmm. So, and and um, Martin a little bit. But we also had dogs always. So we always had dogs on our property. We had usually about 10 to 12 dogs. And so critters usually would stay away. In fact, the dogs might be more than an issue. <laughs> um, especially with the fish racks and the fishing. Um, we don't have any, we have just that one picture of Garth hunting when he was yeah, around yeah. the trip. But, yeah, but we go fishing. Sure. Is yeah. moose meat sustainable? 
When you say sustainable in terms of population? No, as I mean, far as meat, you can nutritionally live on. Um, all those meats are really lean out of fat. Yeah. You know, so if you were really living a subsistence lifestyle and fully subsistence, so for me, I wasn't. I wouldn't be fully right. subsistence because I went there year round. Right. But you would probably be hunting bear as well for fat, fat layers. But moose and caribou, caribou can be pretty fat, um, but moose generally not pretty. That, that's fair. Yeah. Um, a bit about climate that Julie just kind of touched on and just occurred to me. So this upper Yukon, this is this is the upper Yukon River Valley we call this. So again, this is the Yukon River down, 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 out in the Bering Sea. Um, this is one of the coldest areas in Alaska. And I actually just Googled that today too to figure out where. And it was like the fifth cold, coldest village, Eagle, is in Alaska. And it's because you're in this Yukon River Valley, a thousand miles from any coastline. So it's sort of Midwestish, Midwesternish, because it's so isolated from any, any oceans, from any moderating effects. And even if it did have any moderating effects from the ocean, once it freezes, there's no more moderation. I took this picture this morning for my phone. This is what it was in Eagle this morning. Well, 37 well, below at 615 this morning. So, so minus 60 is not unusual. We see it every winter. It just depends if, if you're going to have minus 60, minus 65. The question is, is it going to last for a couple of days or is it going to last for a few weeks? And it can go on for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I think the longest I've ever seen it now in those temperatures, meaning nighttime temperatures, maybe warming up to minus 50 in the day, will be five weeks at a time, which is getting really cool. Yeah, that's a long time to be down those temperatures. Mm -hmm. Rachel, oh. say something. Yeah, okay. And the other thing, too, is that this is considered an inland desert up here, so we get very little precipitation, about nine inches a year. Mm -hmm. But what that means when you combine that with the cold temperatures is that even though you don't get much snowfall, typically what you get stays. Unlike here, we have free stop, free stop, free stop, free stop, and you lose all your snow kind of melts down and builds back up and melts down. And here, these areas, even though you're only nine inches of precipitation, you're building, 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 building. But typically, even in a deep snow year, oh, deep snow winter, you're not deeper than thigh deep or waist deep in the woods. I know what I was gonna say. Another thing too, in Alaska, Alaskans don't use windshields. Like that's just not like they never say, oh, like feel, you know, like oh, it's 37. It's, it's not windshield. socially acceptable. No, it's so easy. You know, yeah, I don't know. We, try to, we try to be humble, but you know, sometimes when people are like, oh, the windshield, we're like, yeah, that doesn't count. <laughs> Which we know it doesn't. Do you want to run through a couple of those? Yeah, so this is, this, uh, we tried to group our pictures. You can imagine we have like thousands and thousands of pictures, but this one I kind of labeled as conditions, the trail, um, to give you some ideas. So this, that's, go back to the one. Okay. So that's a great example of a river freezing in in the fall. Um, which is really nice for hiking if you want to go hiking somewhere because you can walk right up the riverbanks and just follow that, that shore ice, that shelf ice we call it. Um, but uh, also makes it difficult. This is an travel. example of some of the trails, like how they'll be different. That's at the mouth of the Tatonic, actually, in the winter. So, as I said, sometimes you'll hit overflow. Do you want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, I'll talk about overflow real quick. So, interesting phenomenon in Alaska, and I don't know that we see here much. I don't have any snow machine here or much travel, winter travel. But one of the things in Alaska that's really common is what we call overflow. And overflow is water on top of the ice. And paradoxically, it actually happens more at really cold temperatures than at warmer temperatures, but it can happen at both, and it can surprise you at any time. So for example, it could be 60 degrees below zero and you'd be traveling with your dog team. And all of a sudden you run across, you run, you'll find water in front of you that could be an inch deep or it could be two feet deep depending on what's going on. So what's happening there, the dynamics or the, um, what's happening there is as the rivers freeze down in the wintertime, they start to freeze deeper and deeper and deeper towards the river bottom. There's still water flowing underneath, even the coldest rivers with the thickest ice. There's still water, but what's happening is that as that ice freezes, the ice itself becomes thicker and thicker and heavier and heavier. So it starts to drop down and starts to pressurize that water underneath. But at the same time, just like ice cubes in your freezer, as they freeze, they expand and pop and crack, right? So now what happens is that when you get this expanding and popping and cracking, your pressurized water underneath is that you'll get these, maybe not geysering, although sometimes you can see almost like geysering, you'll find this water flowing up through these cracks and then on top of the ice. And it, it really, it's a timing thing. So what happens is you could you could come back to this spot if it's 60 degrees below zero, and two hours later, you might be able to easily travel right through that. So it's really a good luck, bad luck kind of thing. Some rivers are notorious for it, and we know it. We try to, I don't want to say we avoid them, but we always 
travels rivers with a bit of trepidation and wariness, like we know, okay, there's a lot of potential here for, for water. Um, and what that means when we're traveling with dogs, for me, is that I try to keep my foot gear from the knee down as waterproof as possible. And also everything in my sled um, is waterproof, especially emergency clothes, my sleeping bag, and anything else that really can't get wet. Um, because I have, and I've learned it the hard way, where I've been through places like that, where the water's two feet deep, and it's saturated through, sometimes the water's just on top of the ice, and sometimes it's saturated in the snow. And that's really the worst, because all of a sudden, you've got this mashed potatoes where your sled, and the dogs, even though they all got four-wheel drive or four-footed drive, and there might be six or eight or 10 of them, they can't budge this sled through this mashed potatoes of, of ice and water. Um, and then you're gonna be slopping around trying to help the dogs, trying to unload your sled, trying to get it out of the ice, and it can get ugly really fast. The one great thing about dogs in that situation is, is that versus snowmobiles, is that you get yourself in a spot like that with a snowmobile and you're not getting out anytime soon. So most, most people with snowmobiles travel with come-alongs, at the very least with one come along so that they can run it out to a tree and come along their snow machine out before it freezes. Now, especially in really cold temperatures, they can freeze in a half an hour and then you're stuck for a Remember long time. Remember, you're in the middle. I mean, this is just go without saying. You're in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right, so yeah. nobody's going to hear no cell service if that wasn't clear. <laughs> Isn't that dangerous for the dog's paws and legs? No, it's actually not. It, usually what we do after we travel through those areas um, is that if we just give them a minute, um, usually if you can find fresh snow right away, um, they'll all roll in the fresh snow and that fresh snow absorbs any water on their fur. And then you'll see them licking and licking and popping ice off their skin. Trail savvy dogs, trail smart dogs, which most of these bush dogs get really tra trail smart, is they'll stop, they'll chew out their feet, they'll chew out any ice, anything that's bothering them. Um, and so typically it doesn't, it's not an issue unless you push them and push them and push them and don't give them a chance to stop and do that. You know? And breeding for top feet too, like when you're looking, right. when there's so many things you look at in breeding mm -hmm. um, and every musher has a different thought on it, but top feet is something that, you know. Which may be a good time to jump into the dogs a little bit about, I know a lot of people are curious about huskies and sled dogs and there's so much material there, but so the Alaskan, so in general, the dogs we use in Alaska are called Alaskan Huskies, okay? They are a mutt, and that's really important to know. They are not a purebred dog, okay? Unlike your Malamutes, your Siberians, your Samoyeds, your Akitas, your Canadian Eskimo dogs, the Alaskan Husky is a mutt, which means that those dogs can be bred in any direction that you want to breed them, but most people are, that are living up there are breeding for tough feet, good coats, endurance, speed. Those are kind of the primary factors. And so you'll get, in the, Alaska, in the world of Alaskan Huskies, you'll get a lot of different variations, and every kennel might look different. Um, one of the great things about them being a mutt is that genetically they're really strong because they're so diverse. Their gene pool is really diverse. So you don't see a lot of the ailments that you might see in a purebred. Um, so they're really resistant to disease or degenerative effects or, or whatnot. Um, but they, most of them still have this typical husky. <laughs> 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 no, that's great. That's great. Yeah. And obviously puppies are everyone's favorite. So. Yeah. And you see some of those eyes, some of those marble eyes, or the blue eyes from the Siberians. Um, and uh, and they, I mean, maybe, but they're, they were family to us. You know, we, well, we got that. We used to tease, you know, we, as you can imagine, spent a lot of time out just the two of us with just the dogs and we would, you know, tease about the things, what kind of personalities they had and what kind of music, like Zimmer would love, like Jack Jones. <laughs> um, so they were, and, and especially after having that relationship with the dogs, like we haven't, having moved here, we have different critters in our house in the form of our children. So we haven't gone in, we haven't, we don't have any pets now, but especially having um, animals in that sort of way with that sort of relationship. It's, um, so you think, so I think there's for a little bit hesitant some ways to, to, you know, to bring a dog here and have a dog here, or another pet. The type of dog that, oh, <coughs> we don't argue with the dog. When we left Alaska, all of our dogs got integrated into our friend's kennel. Um, and I actually go back and guide most winters, and I'm actually leaving on Sunday to go back to Eagle and guide um, for um, most of the next month. Um, so we used to use those dogs, but the last one just passed away just this past summer. Um, so they were all aged up over the years. Yes. What were those dogs called? Yeah, okay, so these, uh, something about these dogs. Um, so the dogs we use are not 
the most popular dogs in Alaska, but that's, I'm gonna, that's, I'm gonna try to explain this the best I can. Most people in Alaska that are running dogs are racing them, okay? We're not racing dogs, and we don't want racing dogs. So you can think of a dog, so again, remember, you can breed these Alaskan Huskies any way you want. So there's a lot of people, if you're racing, you're breeding purely for speed and endurance, okay? So you can compromise a lot with how you breed those dogs and what you want. But typically, those dogs are small. Think of a light rate, a lightweight runner. Think of a long distance runner. If you, most of the people are smaller framed, lighter bone. Those are the ones that do really well. They get their less injury prone. Same thing with dogs. So, but what we needed, we're not racing, and instead we're calling heavy loads a lot. We're traveling back and forth. We're breaking trail in deep snow. So what we want is probably what more you think about. Uh, in the days of Sergeant Preston and beyond, where you, these bigger working, what we call track line dogs. Typically 70 to 90 to 100 pounds, long-legged, stronger, more strong than fast. And that's what we needed, that's what we wanted. But that is not actually what we, what's happening most of the time in Alaska now. Most people are reading are, are for racing, which means they're breeding a 35 to 55 pound dog that can go 200 miles in a shot in 24 hours without stopping. And you can't do that with a big dog. Or you might be able to occasionally, but they're more injury prone. They just don't have that kind of endurance that the smaller dogs do. Yeah. So that's a, literally, there's so much we can talk about the dogs. And, and they, like Julie referenced, they're, they're like family to us because, you know, if you think about like a work animal that you have on a farm or you have your horse or you know, you have, you have this relationship where they're a working animal, but we also have the dogs just like you have a companion dog at home. And so you have a, this really beautiful combination of a, of, a, of a family pet and a dog that will work and work and work for you. And so it becomes sort of this complete relationship, at least in, in my view, that like they're working with you, they're working for you. You're giving them as much love and freedom and uh, structure as you can. And it's sort of this really beautiful give and take relationship. And so, for example, at night, we would typically in the cabin have three or five dogs in the cabin every night, sleeping in the cabin, we try to rotate through the kennel. For us, it normally meant be anywhere from eight to 12 dogs total. It was enough for the two of us um, at any given time in our kennel. And usually that, that also was composed of a couple, maybe one or two puppies and one or two older dogs that maybe wasn't running the team anymore, but could still run alongside the sled. Uh, not necessarily be working, but running. Yeah, Erica. I was just going to ask more about housing the dogs. Did you yeah. have to heat where they stayed? No, okay. okay. So let's talk about the toughness of these dogs, too. Yeah. So these Alaskan Huskies, or Huskies in general, are, if they're not too watered down, in the racing world, they get a lot of water down, but you can cross them down with hounds and other lighter coated dogs. Um, but these Alaskan Huskies, or these more pure Huskies, can sleep out, so for example, in some of the long distance races, races where you're still using a more traditional dog, they can run 100 miles in a day at 60 degrees below zero, they can sleep on the snow for eight hours and get up and do it again, and then do it again, and do it again. Like that's how tough these dogs are. Like they're phenomenal, and you can't put enough stress on how, how incredibly tough these dogs are as endurance athletes. And not just as, in, not like an endurance runner, they can run 100 miles, you know, like some people can, but they can run and have nothing. And it's the, really the, the, the limiting factor is calories. And so as, as long as you can keep enough calories on these dogs, and typically that means on these, if you're running them that far, and some of the races are, then you're looking at five to 10,000 calories. And if you can do that, I've never ever heard of a dog getting frost injured or dying from exposure unless it was malfed or malnourished. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Good question, Daniel, yeah, the, the fish ones? Yeah. Okay, so when you're living in the bush, perfect world situation is that you're fishing for your dogs. Okay, they will eat salmon and love it. Okay, and that's the cheapest way to, to feed your dogs. Okay, you can't just eat salmon alone. Um, but to talk about the salmon runs on the Yukon River. So on the Yukon River, there's two primary salmon runs. There's the king salmon, okay, and there's also um, the chum salmon, okay. King salmon come in midsummer. Chunk, some, chunk salmon come in the fall. King salmon can't, can only be fished for human consumption on a very limited basis. Chum salmon, depending on the, on the runs and how heavy the runs are, meaning how many tens of thousands of fish are moving up the river in different pulses, can be fished on a subsistence basis and fed to dogs. It's part of the subsistence lifestyle. And when they put these laws into effect, they built in a subsistence use uh, factor for salmon and for feeding them the dog team. So, 
if you're going to feed fish alone, and Julie's going to show some pictures of uh, fish wheels and, and gill nets, um, is that we usually figured a half a fish per dog per day. And chum salmon run anywhere from 6 to 10 pounds a piece. Um, but you can't usually just feed fish. There's not quite enough in them. So normally we, we would feed fish cooked with rice, cooked with fat. So normally we bring in 50 pound bags of rice, two or three or four or six of them in the winter. We bring in five, five gallon buckets of lard um, or chicken fat, and then we mix that. And so these are all chum salmon, and you can catch them by the thousands, um, depending on what kind of technique you're using. Um, there's no limit to the take on the years when um, the Department of Fisheries has determined that there's enough fish running in the river. Alaska, the, the U.S. and Alaska has a treaty with Canada that a certain number of fish have to be allowed into Canada back to their spawning grounds. Okay, so there's there's stations along the way. I think there's three stations on the Yukon River where the fisheries are measuring with sonar how many fish are passing these stations. Okay, and I don't know what the number is. Fifty thousand fish have to get into Canada. Hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand. I'm not sure what it is. Um, so on the years when those numbers are low. Fishing might be limited to like one 12, you know, a 12 hour period, three times a week. There's openings and closures of the fishery. So you have to be really careful about that. Um, it can become very contentious because sometimes these downriver communities are allowed to fish, and there's even commercial fishing sometimes down here. And then by the time you get upstream, the people that are living subsistently off the land are saying, if they close the fishery, they're like, well, how can you how can you allow commercial fishing when people that are supposed to be subsistence fishing, which there's a subsistence priority. Now, subsistence is supposed to be given priority when they close the fishery, so it can create a lot of some conflict. Right? And I was just going to say here, like, so this is a fish wheel that I imagine that this is something that most people have seen. Yeah. Um, this is sour, not that I was much of a fisher before this, but this is sour us on traditional, like fishing with a pole because essentially this, Matt, we have, this isn't ours, but Matt built one that we had as well, was a little bit smaller, but essentially the baskets are running with the current and as the salmon come through, so basically it's it's set out like what maybe 30 feet from the from the water's edge, and there's a with a pole, and underneath the pole there's a fencing, so that as the fish come to it, swim against that fencing, they go down, they go down, and then the baskets are coming through, sweeping up the fish, and so as it sweeps up the fish, it'll come around, and as you can see, the v. that V, they slide down and go into these buckets, into mm -hmm. these boxes. And so like Matt said, there's days you'll go out and check the fish, you know, you'll go out multiple times. Um, and during the fish runs, it's like all you do. You, you know, like you're checking it and then you have to go, you have to go process the fish and get it hung. Um, and so uh, we too, when we ran our fish show because of the time period that we were out there, it was more towards the end in September more than the summer because the fish runs are typically between June and September where we lived. And so it's starting to freeze at night. Um, then, so we didn't really have to worry about cutting them as much as, like, in those pictures we were at a friend's house and they were, um, that was earlier in the summer, but for us we didn't just hang them. Do we show that video where we're going to make these dogs? Yeah, sure, I'll just make a note on this too. So these fish wheels, I mean, you can catch, it's hard to imagine, but you can catch five, six, seven hundred fish a day in a 24 hour period. <coughs> They're a passive fishing device that's being current driven. So those baskets are, remember the salmon are swimming upstream to spawn. These baskets, the, the, the current's going this way, and the baskets are being pushed by the current, so they're just constantly scooping. So it's a fish come, scoops, slides out into the sides. I mean, that's a good fish, that's an incredibly high fishing day, five, six, seven hundred fish. Typically for me, with a small fish wheel on a good day, it might be 40 fish, 50 fish. Yeah, and then um, and this will probably be a good segue into the guiding, but um, so one of the things that Matt that our friends, Wayne and Scarlett, who are the first family downriver from um, Eagle. So they have a little, uh, a little business, uh, a dog mushing business where people can come in and do dog mushing trips. Um, and so in the, Matt, actually, Matt and I actually met um, doing dog mushing in, in the Juno, but on the spectrum of dog mushing in Alaska, there's things where, where we met, where people come in on a cruise ship and they fly up to the glacier and they do like a little half hour Tour at this, we lived at a helicopter support camp there, and then they would go back down on the cruise ship for the day. This is the other end of the spectrum where people come in for anywhere from a week to eight weeks. They run their own teams. It's a one on one, sometimes two to one experience, but they have their own team. Um, and it's out in the Alaskan wilderness, very remote. A lot of these videos and best pictures come from So that's where a lot, that's why we have so many of your clients come out. And so Matt um, did that while he was in. Um, 
Eagle, and then he continued. When we left Alaska, our friends that own the business told Matt, you know, you can always come back and guide. And so, of course, there wasn't much thought that needed to go into that for Matt to go back and guide. So he still does that every. So he's actually leaving again on March, uh, in Mar on Sunday to go back up um, for for a few weeks to run some trips. But this. So the guide season is usually about from January 1st to April 1st, so it's pretty short, three months, January, February, March. Um, and so, in it, in this again, is a very small operation, it's sort of a, it's a, it's friends of ours, husband and wife with three guides, and so we might see 35 or 40 people in the winter, clients that come up and do trips. They're very personalized, very customized. So yeah, um, so this is just one of the videos that the clients put together. But this, this shows, a little bit of the coldness. This is for 60 below me. This is a feeding dog. Okay. Film anything at 60 degrees below zero is really hard to keep your batteries warm enough to. So, you know, everyone have heat packs taped to your camera, taped to your video equipment, um, just to keep them even semi functional, tucked deep inside a parka. This is the fish. Oh. Yeah. 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 Are there pickleball courts up there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're seeing one. So that's a challenge for them. <laughs> so they can see yes. them frozen. Yes. They're able to eat them frozen. At yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously it's a great conditioning too. I mean, they've learned the muscle just like some, you know, kids learn to love certain things. Yeah. But it's also really good for their teeth. Um, because they're tough to eat and you know they're really I don't know, they're really yeah. And those are fat balls, so these are literally we would get five gallon buckets of fat from the from the store. I you from from just those. Uh, anyway, dog. but we pour them in ice cube trays and freeze them. Those would be like snacks from the dogs. They love them. Since I'm here, I'm just gonna show this. Is it good for your teeth? Does it like um, keep harder? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's like kind of like us eating apples, you know, it's some kind of like buckets where they have to really chew and bite their teeth. Yeah. So what's your communication uh, okay, system for, yeah. like, you know, knowing how many salmon you can get or what it, whatever you have to communicate about? Um, so explain that question just a little bit more. Well, you are using um, various bands of radio to get info. Okay. Um, so it depends. A lot of it's by what we call bush telegraph, just word of mouth. People hear, people eagle hear by radio, by internet, what's going on, and then they'll communicate that information to people that are going down, that are down river fishing or doing whatever they might need. It is amazing yeah. that we will get to town and like we'll told one person on the way, and like it takes us. Like, and by the time we get to town, people already know something. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to touch on communication a little bit. And communication for me was sort of a philosophical thing. When I first lived out here at this cabin, I wanted, in my first years in Alaska, even up here, I didn't want any communication. So I didn't have a sat phone, I didn't have a shortwave radio, I just didn't want anything. I wasn't interested in it, but I was also living alone. And it didn't matter, other than maybe my parents. And I disappeared. Everyone knew I was up there somewhere, but it didn't matter. So I'd go months without communication. So, great example. I was living up here during 9 11. Okay, and 9 11 was obviously in September. When I came, I didn't hear about it until I came out in November, mid November, that that had transpired. Okay, so that's kind of an example. Once, and that was the case here too, when I was living in our cabin in Potomac, I didn't have any communication by choice. Now, when we go up, we always carry a sack on because typically we have kids with us, we have other responsibilities, we're more accountable. Um, but for me, I just didn't want the noise of civilization, so to speak. Um, so that was kind of my. The first time I went up there for freeze up when we were up there that time, I, we brought the sap home with us that we borrowed. I just didn't let it go. So. Yeah, that was great. So, do you want? We should have been so trying to have it in here. Really. Oh, yeah. Great. Like, we really struggle with like how to go about this. Yeah. Do you have a question? Um, my boy was wondering as far as if you're out with your dogs, 
and they get hurt. Are you pretty bet savvy? Or are you, I mean, yeah, yeah. So actually, that's one thing you get really good at. And we actually were fortunate enough about 15 years ago to have a vet who would actually come out in the bush and do emergency vet clinics and teach teach mushers how to deal with dog injuries. Um, and so everything from sutures to IVs to you know, and we would have a, I would have a multi-purpose first aid kit that would have full spectrum of dog antibiotics, full spectrum of people antibiotics, um, lidocaine, different sedatives for dogs so that I could, so I could sedate them and then do microsurgeries or pull porcupine quills or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, we had a lot of um, time and energy, but the dogs are actually surprisingly durable in that way too. Um, and that you can do open surgeries on them on your kitchen table and not worry about infection. Like that's another aspect that was really, and you have vets that come up and do spades and you're just boom, 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 just like in a room like this, without thinking twice about it and without ever having any issues. Um, so yeah. yeah. What's your schedule like as far as when you go up and when you come back? Now or what did it used to be? Now, typically, I'm up for depending on how Julie is feeling and where the kids are at. So we've got a we six, have, yeah. four, and a two-year-old right now. And so, so when that went up like two years ago, like I had, we had, I had like a nine-month-old, to a one, a one and a half-year-old, and a three and a half-year-old. Sometimes I get away for a month and a half if I'm really lucky. But <laughs> this year, I'm going up for just under three weeks, and I'm just doing, I'm guiding one trip uh, with clients that came a couple years ago. So it really depends on where we're at, how, things are, how much coverage we can get, how much family's willing to help out. Um, yeah, and we brought our kids up. So since we moved to Baroque, we're trying to figure this out, right? I mean, it's not like we can just hop on one plane and get to where we need to be. Like, for us to bring our kids, and having our kids now, and they're still so little, so how do we make that work? So what we've done um, since we've moved here is masks on up every day. Um, uh, it was interesting to say that every other year we've gone up. Not, I've gone up to peak now with the kids, either at the end of his tours or no, getting up at all. Yeah, we haven't talked about this cabin much, so let's just touch on this real quick. So, this cabin, I was talking about when I got to Eagle, my friend Andy, he was able to connect me to the spot. I spent a winter in one cabin. The next year I found a piece of property that somebody let me use. I, they gave me permission to use. They had a 60 acre native allotment they had bought about 10 years ago from a family. They said, go ahead and use it as if it was your own, but if you ever decide to leave, just leave it how you found it. So I built this cabin, knowing that I never was going to leave it. <laughs> and I was never going to have to burn it or dismantle it. <laughs> That's how committed I was to this, to this lifestyle. So anyway, so this is a cabin that was built in the uh, fall of 2003 or 2004. Okay? Um, this was a month and a half to build, myself and two friends. It was a 15 by 15 cabin. Later on, we, got, we put a 10 foot addition on it a few years later. Um, Incredibly arduous, but only because our time frame was so compressed. We had winter cr cracking in on us. We were living in pup tents with no heat source other than a, a Coleman stove to cook our food on. And so we were, and every day the only way to stay warm is just to go work on the cabin. So you'd work out at the moment, you got up and you'd be able to pull yourself out of your sleeping bag. There wasn't snow on the ground yet, although we did get summer in the cabin building across. And then we worked and worked and worked for a month and a half. My friend Max, that 18 year old with uh, ADHD and work ethic. He had to leave in the middle of October. The day I took him to town, the day before I took him to town, we had just put the sod on the roof and we had cut the window openings out of the cabin and taped them over and tarped them over. Um, and then I spent the, another month or two after that working on the fine details of the cabin. Matt says too that the cabin cost three hundred dollars to build, and that includes like a twenty dollar, no, like a seventeen dollar box of like bulk Snickers you get. So it's like he can't be happy. Yeah, so just keep Max. I knew I could just throw him a Snickers bar about once a day, and it would keep him going for, forever. <laughs> He's right here. Yeah. I've never seen Max since. So. <laughs> but everything, so everything was built with hand tools and a chainsaw, and so the yeah. logs were from the land. A box of spikes, a box of cabin spikes, um, fuel. Go back to that again. So. So one of the reasons we were able to build a cabin really fast is that you probably couldn't, not to say this was easy, but you couldn't have a more ideal cabin building situation. So in 1990, this was 2004, in 1999 a forest fire had blazed through this area, about a three million acre forest fire, had burned through this entire valley and across a multiple valleys. So what you see in the background are all these needles. 
and all those are all trees. So when I got there, about 90% of the forest fan was still standing. Okay? But all every tree was dead. All the bark had been burned off it. And these trees have been standing for five years. And they were all almost a perfect building diameter. So they were about maybe 12 inches at the butt, 9 inches. I, had, I was cutting 17 foot logs. So 9 inches on the tip is what I needed. That's what I was going with. And so we were able to almost carry every log one person could carry a log. Okay, that's how light they were. They were probably in the 150 pound range. Light there. Two people could certainly carry them. Um, and, uh, and so what I did the first day I got to this cabin site is I just, with my chainsaw, I dropped everything in a 200 by 200 foot square and just opened up a square and then built a cabin right in the middle of that square, putting all the trees into it that I had cut to open up that, that clearing. You know, and what we found over the years is about maybe 10% of those trees were falling, falling, falling every year. So as the years go on, it's getting harder and harder to find good wood to, to, um, to build with or use for fire because it's all, now it's all on the ground and starting to rot. And travel in this country now is really difficult because all those trees are now pick up sticked on the ground like this. So trying to travel through it with a dog team, whether there's snow or not, or on foot, is really difficult. You know. So and then we, built, we also built a sauna. Um, the year after that, which is a great multi-purpose building. Um, there's an interior that happened there. So all the woodwork too is, is built too. Which... Yeah, everything just came from the land. It was. It doesn't make any sense in that area to haul materials up there. It's, you have to bring it all the way from Fairbanks to 400 miles by road. Then you yeah, have to put it in a boat or in a dog team. And then when we leave in the spring, we put what we call bear shutters on. So it's all these pieces of plywood or wood with hundreds of nails sticking out of them, just to deter a bear from wanting to mess around with it. And knock on wood, we've never had a, an <laughs> issue. <laughs> we've never had an issue with bears uh, marauding a cabin or breaking into it or causing any damage. Um, and these are just some examples of cabin life in the winter. Um, you use the, like a chainsaw mill? Chainsaw mill in Alaska mill. The great thing about a chainsaw mill, if you're familiar with those with an Alaska mill, is you attach a type of mill you attach to the bar of your chainsaw and you can carry the whole thing with you into the woods. You can bring it to the tree rather than bring the tree to the mill, which when you're working by yourself or with only one or two people, you have no other mechanical ability. You, have, you don't have a four-wheeler, you don't have a snow machine, you don't have power witches. It's really nice to be able to go into the woods, cut what you want, bring it back out. So let's go back to the bathroom picture. <laughs> oh, yeah. What is it? The, no, the next, yeah, what is that's a bathroom. So that's the outhouse. Oh, God. Yeah. And that one was fun because we built it. I built it so it was like good view. The dog, you guys are the dog yard. Like it'd be a dog house, dog house, dog house, dog house. And the dogs love it. So you go sit in the outhouse and you talk to the dogs. <laughs> Watch the stars, the northern lights. Anyway. Matt actually built that outhouse, I think, at the very end. That was like the last thing that he yeah. did. So he had this like really spindly. So Matt has this beautiful cabin out there that's known out for there, that's beautiful, like all the clients want to go out to it, people are known for it, and then you had this like spindly, like they were like sticks at you with a like broken tarp over the it. blue tarp around And our friend yeah, Wayne would always give you trouble, he was like, here you've got this crash and my husband can't even build a good outhouse, and then right when we left, he finally took <laughs> a nice outhouse. Let's do it. Um, so what are you doing, bro? <laughs> what are you doing, bro? Do well, let's see. So I, I, I'm home with the kids about a day and a half a week. I work for Valley Stewardship Network, which is a small conservation nonprofit. I do some landscaping and carpentry work. So um, Drew is the one who has a more consistent job with benefits. And so we just need one of us with benefits. So that was kind of the way it worked out. That's how the pieces fell in place. And she works where? Uh, Wisconsin Women's Business Initiative Corporation. What is it? It's a statewide nonprofit that supports small business owners and entrepreneurs. This is oh, so why it is now six and a half. Um, that's, that's why Miss Kathy, that's why that's his, one of his teachers. Um, when he, so when so this is when, when we were still kind of in Alaska, um, prior to moving to Fairbanks. So we moved here to, to Baroka. So he was here, we moved here when he was about three, I think. Um, this is, that's a different cabin that we used when we were out there. Trying to get to the You didn't talk about your sled yet either that you had. Oh, the sleds. Yeah, let me pass this one around to you. This is, so one of the ways I make income uh, in the bush, and this is a miniature version, and sometimes I build and sell those just for fun, but I would build full-size dog sleds for friends and other people that lived out there that wanted sleds, and that was a, a way to generate some income. 
Um, and for me, I would just build them all by hand in the cabin throughout, I'd build maybe a couple of winter. And typically those big new sleds sell for a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a piece. Um, when you're living in the bush like that, you, you don't really put a price on your time. time. Time doesn't count as money, it's just time. And so for me, that was a thousand and fifty. Other than a couple hundred dollars in materials, that was all just profit in my mind. I liked having uh, a hobby, uh, something to work on, uh, projects to have in the cabin. Yeah. And that was uh, so that was kind of a sideline. Um, I also like really traditional things, and so I would just usually build full wooden sleds, and then it'll eventually have more and more into what we call a toboggan type sled, which would have a plastic uh, base to it as well. What's the season for the northern lights when you see those? Well, as soon as it gets, any time it gets dark enough, yeah, so it could be, I mean, you could be seeing them as early as August, um, all the way through into April, but of course, in the middle of the winter, you're, the daylight, it's all solar activity based, so that's not based on any time of year, it's just more when you have longer hours that you can actually see the, the northern lights, the aurora borealis. Um, and this is actually a really good place to see them too, because there's zero light pollution coming from anywhere. Uh, but this is an example of steam bending, of bending runners. Um, that's the beginning of building a dog sled, steaming ash, ash runners or... Um, and Matt learned how to build them, we kind of referenced this earlier, but when he was teaching, like basically the way he told me that he would teach all day and then school, as soon as school was over, he'd go over and catch up with Don, who was an Eskimo elder in the village, and would just spend the next couple hours in his shop while Don built his sled. And I asked Matt too, I was like, what do you think about you being there? Like, do you ever, he's like, yeah, but I ask too many questions. Because Eskimo yeah. culture is a very quiet culture too. Yeah. Watch and learn. Watch, Watch and learn, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. And then everything I that when I did by hand, you know, you saw the hand, the hand drill there, I was planing everything by hand, I was ripping everything by hand, these hardwood planks, these hickory planks and ash planks. But eventually I bought a little baby generator, and once I started running that little generator, a little four-stroke generator, then the first thing I got was a drill, because I can't tell you how many times I've spun, you know, trying to, trying to drill through hickory and, you know, all these endless holes. And the other thing I bought was a hand planer, electric hand planer that, planer that I could run. And then I bought a small skill saw that I could rip with, and those changed my life and saved my hands, I think, from definite arthritis. Do you have a uh, solar panel up there? So I did, and that was a small addition too, Jeff, so I usually, I always just use lanterns. Um, but at one point I just wanted to add more light to the cabinet, and I found with lanterns that I was still always walking around with a headlamp on my head, always in the cabin, just to add more spotlight. Um, and so eventually I thought, well, let me get a little, deep cycle 12 volt marine battery, I mean, 60 pounds I could throw in the dog sled. So I buy a new one of those, I bought a new one of those, I put it in the cabin, then I tripped charged it with a solar panel. And the main reason I had the battery was just to run a couple lights, one in the kitchen, one over the workbench, and then I could also run like a CD player um, that I'd have to keep running batteries through. And so those are the main reasons I main reasons I had, you know, I went to some kind of 12 volt system. Mm -hmm. So you're able to use the water from the stream? Yeah. So all the water comes right from the river, and there's not absolutely nothing above the cabin. It just it's a hundred miles of wilderness into Canada into the mountains. What's that? That was the second question, right? Yeah. So you'll see. I mean, one of the things about life here is, is buckets, buckets and buckets of water, buckets to sit on, buckets of food, buckets of um, buckets. Or you can see doing a water run with buckets in the sled, getting ready to head out. And um, we find different way, different sources of water depending on the year and how the river froze. Um, all the wood came right from the land, um, the meat came from the land, and most other supplies were brought in. I was just going to tell a story for breakfast the earlier, so just kind of... Julie getting water. That's you. It look, is that me? That's okay. <laughs> I was saying, it's you. Where do you belong? Get water. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. uh, one of the funny stories uh, are just kind of to talk about the conditions and the ice and how thick it was. So one of the times that I went out to visit Matt, um, he had been out with clients for two weeks and it was in it was very cold. It was like 60 below that for those whole two weeks. And he so he had been back to the cabin a couple times but didn't open up the water hole during that time. So he picked I flew in There's on the same water hole there. Okay. Yeah, I flew in on the same flight that the client left in on. We went down we back down to the cabin. Matt was like super reluctant to not gonna open up the water hole. And so finally we go out there and he brings his chainsaw and a bunch of tools with him and he gets up to like, you know, it's about maybe a hundred yards from the cabin itself. And he pulls off the you know, uh, gets the snow off of it and gets the wood and, and some people use insulation too to try to keep it from freezing over. And so then it's just ice and it's froze over and he gets his chainsaw out and he stands in the depression and he chainsaws one side of it 
and then he chainsaws the other side. <laughs> and then he chainsaws this side. And I'm like over on the side, I'm like, and this has been, you can imagine, like I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago too, so like, um, you know, being out there and learning this stuff. Um, and I'm like, what are, and then I see him go to like do the backside too, and I'm like, what are you doing? Um, but sure enough, I learned, like it took us about a half hour because the ice when we finally pulled it out was, you know, a couple of feet thick. So the chainsaw blade wasn't even touching the, and Matt knew that, I didn't know that. Um, but there's so many instances like that. And that was only after two weeks of not, you know, opening the water hole. Um, so typically, if you were to try to open up a water hole in the ice in these rivers, you're going to be looking at, if you're midwinter, you're looking at a minimum of 24 inches of ice. And in some places, you might be five feet, which you, there's no way for you to be five feet of ice. So you're trying to look for thin spots. And luckily, usually on these rivers, these rivers that are part of rivers that are moving fast in places, you can usually find an open lean, if you call it, an open, where the water's open because it's just moving so fast. And even at 60 below, it doesn't freeze open. So that was one of those pictures with the water buckets where we had an open lead. And that's the best case scenario. You can just dip a bucket and go. You don't have to keep a water hole open and try to protect it from freezing. And, um, or you can gather the water in place like this. Yeah, I'll show this to you. It's 7.32 and I asked what the time was set before. Should we, like, I don't want to... Trina, what do you... Do you want us to keep going? We close at 8. Yep. Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. So you if you have this game, you understand. But what do you think? Should we keep just another... Five or ten minutes? Is that... Is that really still going? Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, but okay. if you have to leave, we'll get it. Yeah. Um, I was just going to show this video. This is a video that uh, we, when we were out last March, so about actually a month or a year ago, that was our case. It just shows a little bit of the trail conditions too. And how they can show it. Hi. Taking a video. Is it wet out here? Is it muddy? So that's a great example of an unseasonally warm spring. It's like 50 degrees out. The snow is all melted, and so it's on top of the ice. It appears to be unsafe because you, it's kind of spooky at first to think about that you're running through water on ice. But what you have to realize is that underneath that water, the ice is two, three, four, five feet thick. You can land an airplane on this ice and be fine. Um, but when you're first getting used to it, in my first couple of years in Alaska, I was like, water on top of ice is way too spooky. Um, and we were all programmed to fear, you know, thin ice, which is it's a survival instinct and it's important. Okay, this last. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, does that help you slide the It actually never get going that fast, but it does increase. It does decrease friction for sure. Having water like that, and the dogs I think enjoy it to a point because once they get used to it, they're like, oh, I'm just running through the water, and it seems like everyone kind of cheers up a little bit. I was. I was just going to say to you with that, like I had a moment when we were out with our kids last year where we were hitting one of those patches where the water was thick but was safe. And Matt, I remember like I had Wyatt and the sled, he had our other two, and we were coming to a spot that he knew and could see the water. And he like turned back to me and he's like, just remember the sleds float, you just got to keep them upright. And I was like, okay. <laughs> got it. But, but again, like I know now too, like I could stand up in that water, like we would get wet. Like in that was, in that trip too, we knew with our kids, um, especially being out there and to get from, we, that first trip we went from Wayne and Scarlet to Nate's um, with our kids and that was going to be a five hour trip um, because of the conditions. And so it's funny because Wayne gave me grief and was like, I totally thought you were going to throw, turn Matt around. Um, having the kids and I think part of it too is it was slow going um, but for me I knew like I first of all I trusted Matt um, and Nate our friends who brought us out there as well he was with us but also I knew as long as we kept them dry they would be fine and so for me like I definitely prefer to be warm and in that scenario than it being cold and people freezing so I knew as long as they, they might be uncomfortable they might get bored but they were going to live and it would be they'd be better for it <laughs> so so these pictures are from some of the trips Matt runs. So I'll just maybe just let the slide yeah, go, and then yeah. we can, and then we'll try to wrap it up. Yeah. That was my question, Matt. When you go back up on Sunday, what what do you do with clients? What do we do? Yeah. Okay, so these all these pictures are going to be an example of current oh, client trips. Great. So normally, what we do if someone's new to it, it, it hasn't been with us before, it hasn't run dogs before at all, is that we spend they fly into the home, we get to them to the homestead which is Wayne and Scarlett's cabin here. They fly into Eagle, which is just an airstrip with an outhouse. They get dropped off, we pick them up, uh, usually by snow machines, sometimes by dog sled. We get them down to Wayne and Scarlett's cabin. On day two, we do a training day. And so what that means is we take them out. Each person has their own dog team. So let's say, Jeff and Andy, let's say you guys came, for example, just to give an example. So 
I would have my dog team, Jeff would have his dog team, Angie had her dog team, and we would, you would be trained to work with your dogs. You're still going to be following me, and your dogs are probably going to do whatever I do, but everyone's, everyone's driving their own dog team, so to speak. And then on day three, usually we leave the homestead and we're gone until however long you've booked a trip for. So if you're coming for 10 days, we'll be gone for eight days on the trail. Well, we're on the trail, depending on what you personally want, what you're up for, we might either hop from cabin to cabin to cabin, um, or we might use tent camps like this, uh, travel camps that we set up each night, depending on how remote we go, how long the trip is, what the travel conditions are like. Um, so there's a myriad of things we can do. Some years we're limited by trail conditions. The snow is too deep. The snow is not deep enough. The temperatures are too warm. The temperatures are too cold. It really varies quite a bit, but this is a great example of a tent camp. Um, we cook water, melt water for the dogs, usually on these tripods. We melt snow for water, feed the dogs that way. Um, we, so typically it's a, it's a winter camping trip with dogs, and the dogs are your locomotion. And the neat thing about it, too, is that you're developing at the same time this really personal relationship with those five or six dogs that are pulling you. And so you learn how to, how to harness them, how to feed them, how to take care of them, how to, you know, how to give them the attention they need, how to command them, so to speak. Um, it becomes, for most, it's a really unique experience, and that's also really authentic. And I'm not trying to sell it to anybody. I'm just saying that as far as an authentic experience, like it's pretty unbeatable. Um, and it's just so unique in the world. And this company, my friends that I work with, Bush Alaska Expeditions, are one of the only companies in the world that are doing this kind of thing. Um, most people are doing a day trip, an hour-long trip, uh, maybe an overnight. Uh, but to do one week, two week, six week expeditions is really unusual in the dog washing world. Um, it's not cheap, and the logistics, the logistics are not easy. Um, but it's pretty. Uh, it can be pretty incredible. And then there's epic hardship days like that. <laughs> and that was an expedition that was. A client from Denmark came and wanted to do a six-week trip up to the, the um, Arctic Ocean. Um, and, uh, I was just saying, are the tents set up? No. Or are you, you're every morning we're breaking them, them down, and, them down and, and every evening them. we're setting them back up again. And we have little wood stoves inside them, so we need to also cut wood every evening. Um, tent camping is, is tough because not only are you taking care of dogs and yourself, but you're also cutting firewood, you're setting up tents, you're setting up new lines for the dogs, you're melting water, you're you know, you're also carrying all the supplies you need for a week or two weeks. So, yeah, occasionally we'll resupply by airplane if we're out for more than 10 days typically, because we can't usually carry that much dog food or, or fish or snacks or people food. Um, these are some more extreme examples of things. And the nice thing about this is we can really cater these trips. So most people can do a trip, but we so we can we can make a trip really hard. And we can make a trip relatively, I wouldn't say easy, but relatively reasonable for most people. And for most people, I find the limiting factor is a little bit of agility. Like if you have a sense of agility, like we find people that have skied before do really well because standing on the runners of a dog sled and being able to gimbal your body like you're on a boat is really 80% of like being able to stay on the runners and feel comfortable. And that's one of the, I mean, there have been sometimes the communication with the client beforehand, but that's one of the first things during orientation. I've been at the table, and because our cabins obviously are very small, we as early cabin, we're like all in the same room. Um, and that's one of the things I'll ever get, well, what are your goals here? And some people, it's like, I really want to like go in an outhouse at 40 below, or I want to sleep outside, or I want to see the northern lights. Um, some people are like, want the, um, want the extreme travel. Um, so that, those are all things. Do you want to close that video? Do yeah. Video? We're going to run one video here at the end, and we can kind of take questions too on the side, but there's one really kind of cool video you want to show. Yeah, sure. Um, that, that was a client video. I had a couple of clients from New Zealand. Um, typically, we get about 50% Americans, 50% of clients from overseas. We get a lot of Australians, a lot of New Zealanders, a lot of uh, Scandinavians, a lot of Germans. Um, and so we, I have two clients from New Zealand, and we did this really kind of epic trip, and they were able to capture it with GoPros. And so this is a video that they posted to YouTube called the Big River Crossing. And uh, what you're going to see in this video is that one of the clients actually ends up in the water, <laughs> which is a big no-no. Okay, don't a, tell your boss. Don't tell my boss. <laughs> anyway, on their website. But what you're going to see is we had actually run this, this canyon the day before and practiced this run because they really wanted to get the whole videotape thing. So I went after we had practiced and we got it all dialed in. They had run it. They knew what they were doing. And then they wanted me to go ahead and try to film as much as I could of them coming. So what you'll see is me take off and tell them to wait until I 
park my dog team and walk back a little bit so I can watch them through a difficult section. They left before that moment, and so what you're going to see is there was a little miscommunication. <laughs> You'll see what happens. But anyway, it's kind of a fun one to show, and it's really beautiful terrain. So we'll close with that. Yeah, and I have to say, we had so many unsure roles tonight. We're like, oh, we should have said that. We should have said that. So, um, you, you can know. come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here I was talking to a lady today, and she said who would love to have had a contact, but as much as I do know something about her, I don't, I, her, her name is Nakwa. Have you ever met anyone? N-A-Q-U-A-A. -A. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is there any way that I could have any, I don't think she would bother you a lot. Is there any way we could have a, a Yeah, we yeah let's connect her afterwards. Yeah, definitely. Okay. After the, yeah, after this, we can connect and give you our, our contact information. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, also, too, uh, a couple of things. The water. So I asked him, I said, do you remember how much, how cold it was that day? And he says, like, 20 or 30 below in the morning. And the water is running clear because there's a hot spring in the river. So this is actually the Tondic this this River that our cabin is on. Matt is the person who's not otherwise there, too. He's the one with the small axe um, and the one in the front. So. This is probably my favorite video of all time. <laughs> After the last Okay. All right. Okay, you guys, so you guys hold tight, yeah? Famous last words. Hold tight. Yeah. But then I think I say, well, whatever. Okay, I'm going to go. Yeah, I probably should just sit on it. Why do you put the slide on the side? Because <laughs> it keeps the dogs from pulling it. Okay, well, let like it go. Flip it on a slide, sit on it, and there's less chance they can pull it. Because they're going to want to go. They're going to want to pull it. You guys can wait here for a bit, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Sunny little spot, we stopped. It was actually a woman. 
got her all stripped down to her skivvies and put all the, a new kit on her, a new art kit. Is that down? Uh, typically the outer lifts are down, um, but not the not the inner layers. But usually the dogs will go anywhere as long as there's someone in front of them or another dog team in front of them. Even through water like that. They don't really like it, but they'll do it if you ask them to. Or in this case, I lead them first. I walk with the lead dogs of my team to get them to go through, and then all the other dogs just go. They don't really think about it. So you'll see him Matt leading out in front here too. <laughs> and it's not uncommon in deep snow for mushrooms to be on snowshoes. So in this case, we were moving really fast and really hard to get to the south face rock outcropping. That was the warmest spot we could think of. It was 20 degrees below zero that morning in order to get her changed. We stopped. At that point, her gear was starting to freeze, you know, and get it off her right away. And again, that's why we carried everything, everything in the sled is waterproof for the most part. You know, so. Anyway, that was a fun little example of something pretty unique and not common. So. What was the axe for? Uh, what was the axe? What were you using the axe for? Uh, for me, it's when I'm that close to the water and I'm on slippery ice, the axe for me is an insurance policy that either I can grab it to keep myself from sliding in, or in this case, I was also using it to grab dog sleds, to hook an edge of a dog sled and help somebody pull, keep their sled away from the water. Mm -hmm. So it's just a multi-purpose tool. Or if I break through the ice, I've got a way to get myself back out and onto land. Yeah. Angel? Two questions. So, do you supply all of the clothing, and how do you keep your face warm? Yeah, uh, we do. In this case, we do supply all the clothing. Some people prefer to bring their own boots, especially if they're an off size. But over the years, we've got enough boots, good Arctic boots. Um, face for us is usually a combination of a, a neck gaiter is a really important tool. Just a fleece neck gaiter that goes all the way around, and you can pull it up and down as you need to as you get. And then just some kind of good hat. Um, the deep cold is really difficult. 60 below is hard, but we've done it. We've had clients out for three weeks straight of 60 below, and we can really do it, but it's not difficult. It's not that fun. And we're, moving from, right, we're moving from point A to point B pretty quickly, and we're not 10 camp unless we absolutely have to. We're trying to get to a cabin and get a fire going. Where do you breathe in your beer? Like it hurts your neck. Yeah. I remember Okay. What's your access to vegetables and how often do you cans. get that? Cans and canned vegetables, canned fruit. For us, other people have Yeah, other people have gardens, gardens if you so live there year round. Gardens. For me, the live foods for me are sprouts, yogurt, and sourdough. Those are the three like live enzyme foods that you could like keep in a cabin. Everything else was canned, unless you lived there in the summertime and had your gardens and were canned. Plus, when we left our cabin, it would freeze down. So if we left for the night, it would freeze down. So anything we had in there. Have sourdough, yogurt, and sourdough, yogurt, and sprouts. Hmm. Yeah. I was just gonna say thank you to yeah. Matt and Julie because, um, especially you, Matt, for agreeing to do this. <laughs> it's been wonderful. Really.